Hi, this is Dan Bullard, retired electronics engineer, sitting out the front deck of my houseboat again. It's uh, Saturday, and so you'll hear shotguns going off back there. Guys are out there hunting. Hopefully there's nobody going to come by in a boat, but you never know. There we go. Good boom. Okay, I want to talk about laws of physics. Not mine this time. I got a job at Tektronix, and I've mentioned that. And one of the things that really impressed the interviewer, my boss, Brian Brokaw, uh, was when he asked me about what happens when you send a pulse down uh, from a tester, like a 50 ohm transmission line, what happens if it's an open? What happens if it's a short? Now, it was really funny because, um, I, like I mentioned in another video, I interviewed on a Sunday with this guy named Dan, and he like, oh, he was, he was so impressed because he showed me a schematic and said, just tell me about this. And it was a VI, and I'm like, I know everything about VIs. I know everything about a VI. So I went walking, walking him through it, and he's like, slow down, slow down. So Brian asked me, he, he says, I can't hire you just based on Dan's word, so I need to ask you a few questions. He asked me a few questions, and one was on this transmission line. So if you shoot a pulse down a transmission line, and it's not terminated, what happens? Well, it's kind of cool. It's electronics, and electronics is not different from other things, okay? Light waves, and I mean, sound waves, everything, pressure waves, everything, they're all identical. They're all exactly the same. And so back when I was in high school, I think, maybe college, I found this book at the bookstore. I was always in the books. Um, this book named uh, Two Stroke Tuner's Handbook because I was big into two-stroke engines at the time. And Two-Stroke Tuner's Handbook explained how two-strokes worked, which I, I knew how two-strokes worked. But then they talked about, the guy was brilliant, Jennings, I think. Um, he wrote about all the various things you could do to make it better. And if you look on Amazon for the Two-Stroke Tuner's Handbook, which is way out of print, but you can still find copies of it. I sold my copy to a guy in Australia for 50 bucks, and that didn't include the shipping, so he had to pay the shipping too. So it cost him like 70 bucks to get this uh, book shipped over there, and then finally he got it. 50 bucks for a used book, 1974. But the book, if you look at the Amazon reviews, two reviewers say, with this book, I won this race. <laughs> so it's really a valuable book. But the section on expansion chambers was really, really great. And expansion chambers are basically tuned pipes. And it's, you know, it's not for the faint of heart, you know. You have to be pretty good at math. But um, um, when the piston comes down below the exhaust port and opens up, this pulse of hot air comes shooting out of the cylinder and goes into the expansion chamber. Now, if it were just a plain old, you know, exhaust pipe, just a tube, it would just go out and nothing would happen. But it goes in the expansion chamber, and the expansion chamber tapers out. And so to the piston and the combustion chamber, it looks like it's hitting an open, and so it sucks the exhaust right out of it, so the exhaust goes shooting out. The problem is, on a two-stroke, you don't have a separate intake stroke. So, the exhaust stroke and the intake stroke are in the same stroke. So the exhaust port opens, the exhaust gases go out, and they're going down the pipe, and then the transfer ports open. And those are geese out there. And there's, um, Sandhill cranes back there too. So when the exhaust port's open, it shoots all that out. The expansion chamber exhibits a negative pressure because it 
goes out, it expands. Now the transfer port is open and the new charge, because the piston is coming down and pushing the, uh, the, the new charge into the cylinder up the sides, the new charge comes in, the exhaust port is letting the exhaust gases go out. The problem is when these transfer ports are open, the exhaust port is also open. So if there's any pressure left over from the uh, piston shoving a new charge through the transfer ports into the cylinder, that's going to go out the exhaust port. You're going to lose your fuel, and that's one of the problems with two strokes, is you lose a lot of charge going out the exhaust, and they're not very efficient that way. Well, what happens is that pulse goes down the expansion chamber, and then it hits the end, which it could be a flat plate, it could be a cone. Let's imagine it's a flat plate. The exhaust pulse hits that end, goes boom, and bounces back in the opposite phase. Right? It wasn't showing a negative phase before. It was sucking the exhaust out. Now it's going back as a positive pulse. It bounce off of this flat plate. Now it's going back, but it's got to take the time to flow back. And you can't forget about the fact that the air is no longer room temperature. It's hot. So you have to be able to calculate the speed of a wave in a warm atmosphere. And then in the best of scenarios, the new charge comes in, starts going out the exhaust port, the pulse comes back from that plate and gets pushed in. The new charge goes out the exhaust port, gets stuffed back in by that reflection of the positive pulse from the baffle plate back in the expansion chamber. Now the problem with making that a flat plate is that that means it only runs really good at one RPM. So we don't want to do that. It makes it really hard to ride a motorcycle in a race because you can only hold it one RPM and so the guy may be beating you and you can't speed up. If you give it more throttle, it'll roll off. You'll lose power and he'll beat you. So they make it a cone. So it widens, basically it changes the cue, just like in a resonant uh, RLC circuit, it changes the cue, and so it makes it wider in the range of the engine. So the high, you could make it run really good at one RPM, and if you need to run a generator, for example, that would be great. Make it run perfect at 3600 RPM, and now you get it started, throttle automatically goes 3600 RPM and it runs really really good at that one frequency which means that you get 60 Hertz out of your generator but we don't want to do that for a guy who's trying to run a race because we don't want to saddle him with one throttle settle setting that would get him through the race he needs to be able to have some wide range and so we make it a cone we taper it so that the reflection bounces back at various places, various RPMs, so it runs good at some RPMs and uh, not great at one RPM. We need it to be widened, so that's why there's a taper in the end of the expansion chamber. Now this works really great. Um, Jennings puts all the math in there for you to figure out. You can calculate the math for all these things build a proper expansion chamber, which he says, you know, you're going to weld it up and it's going to look really crappy. But if you do it right, it'll really increase performance. So that's really cool. That's, I learned that back when, before I got into college. And so I had a, a way to go when I got into electronics. I had something to build on. And so, um, as I mentioned in one video, I knew this so well when you send a pulse out of a digital tester, down a digital pin, down a coax cable. I would test coax cables of different lengths and try to calculate the length of the coax cable. And I got out a tape measure and I could measure exactly the length of the coax cable by shooting a pulse down. Because 
when the pulse goes out, it goes out 50 ohms. It thinks it sees 50 ohms. It goes out, and then it hits that open, for example. And then bounces back, but now at full voltage. So if you send out a 3-volt pulse, it only goes out at a volt and a half. And it gets there, and it goes, oh, 3 volts. Oh, no. Boom. And so it bounces back at 3 volts. And so that change from 1.5 volts to 3 volts, you can put a comparator to trip at, say, 2.25 volts. So if it sees anything at 2.25 volts, that trips the end of the measure, and you've just measured the round trip time of the, the cable. And divide by 2, multiply by whatever the uh, propagation delay of the uh, cable is, 0.6c or whatever, and you got it. You got the length of the cable. That's how they can measure in a uh, telephone line. They know where to send the guys out to work on a down line. They shoot a pulse down the telephone line, and they can tell where it is along the line. This is really cool stuff. So the expansion chamber in a two-stroke motorcycle leads to an understanding of electronics when you shoot a pulse down a coax cable. It's really cool. In fact, when I was in the radar school, I've mentioned this before, when I was in radar school, um, they did these these tests on us. They were trying to make sure that we could do anything. And so the, the theory was we were, we were taught on the radar, the PPI, the repeater, and then the switchboard, the switch panel, which was an electronic switch panel that switch like this radar to that PPI and so on. And the idea was, let's say you're on a ship and a missile comes in and <coughs> takes out the switch panel and stuff. What are you going to do about it? You've got a whole bunch of coax cables coming from the radar because you've got the, uh, the dish location, you've got the video from the uh, signal coming in from the radar, you've got a bunch of different coax cables. You've got to get them to the PPI so you can see a picture. If you don't get it to work, the captain's going to lose the war and you're going to die because you're on a ship with the captain. You've got to make sure the captain can get those pictures from the radar. So the idea was the instructors would go in and disconnect the entire thing. So disconnect all radar inputs, disconnect all PPI inputs, and you're supposed to take a scope and figure out which signal is which, plug it into the uh, uh, radar patch panel, and you would be able to look it up to the PPI and somebody out there have fun. And get it all working, you know. And, you know, if you get it working, you save your life. If you can't get it working, you're going to die. That's why I went in the Navy. <laughs> you know, the, you go in the Air Force, you're on the ground. You know, you fix something in a plane, and you send the pilot off, and if you didn't do a good job, the pilot's going to die. And you're not going to die. But on a ship, you're part of the war. You're part of the effort. You're part of the, the thing that makes it all work. And so that's why I went in the Navy. It's, it was a really good time, and I learned a lot when I was there. So, what they did was they went in and started disconnecting these coax cable from the, the uh, patch panel, and um, uh, they did a lot of things, a lot of things. They did a lot of bugs. That was the way they trained us, is they put bugs in things. They would take a tube out, and they'd wire up one pin to another and put it back in, and you're supposed to figure out what, what it was. Maybe they wire the grid to the cathode, and so now the tube wouldn't work. It wouldn't. So you would say, "Oh, it's a bad tube." Well, show me, show me the tube, and then you pull it out. And you go, "Oh, look at that! There's a wire on it." So they would do these kind of tricks. It was very cool. And in this one case, they did this. Um, they knocked out this radar signal, and uh, we figured out which signal it was. So we went back to the instructor and said. Okay, that signal is bad. He says, is it open or short? We're like, we don't know. It's bad. It doesn't work. He says, no, no, no. Okay, you got to tell me. Is it open or is it shorted? We thought about it. Now, this is, I was like 19 years old when we did this. And we went back and we figured out what it was, just two of us. 
and I, I knew it, if it's open, it'll look one way. The signal will go, but if it's shorted, it'll go, it'll drop to zero. So if it's shorted, the signal will go out there, and it'll see it's short, and it'll reflect back zero volts. So if it's shorted, it'll drop to zero. If it's open, it'll jump up to full voltage. So we went back and looked at it, and we said, okay, it's open. So it's okay, you're right. So we got, we passed it. That's the way I, I graduated second my class overall because of that. And it was, it was fantastic. I, you know, I can't recommend the military enough. Back in the day, that's the way the military was. Um, it's probably not that way anymore, but it was really good training. And so, like when I went to TTC, went to teach there, my boss, he hired me, and he was so used to hiring and firing guys, he would hire you just to try you out, and if he didn't like you, he'd fire you. Well, he hired me, and he thought he couldn't get enough of me. He loved me, and that's why he made me the dean of instruction after one year. He always knew he could, he could count on me. It was, it was great, and I learned a lot from him. So it was a two-way street, you know, plus I got money out of it and uh, didn't get health insurance. So, so I had to pay for my first kid's birth out of my pocket. That was $2,000 just to have a kid, but it was, it was worth it. Okay, one more thing I want to mention is I found this thing on PBS. PBS did a whole thing on how Feynman was second only to Einstein. Feynman was second only to Einstein. Now, what does that tell you? What does that tell you about me? I proved Feynman wrong. Feynman said that the ear is not very sensitive to the phase difference between harmonics. That's bullshit. Feynman said that, or these other guys said it. But they claim that Feynman said it. It's in Feynman lectures. So, an impulse, which is like the sound of a gun, or white noise, they have exactly the same uh, spectrum. They have exactly the same spectrum magnitude. The magnitude of all the harmonics is exactly the same. The only difference is the phase. With a rifle shot, they're all coalesced into a single place. That's a cosine wave. It's basically the fundamental and a whole bunch of harmonics all in one cosine wave. So they all build up into one cosine wave. With white noise, it's all random phases. And we did that with periodic white noise, and I did that with my TCF test. One of the cool things is, there was a TV show, you may remember, Firefly. And in one episode of Firefly, they did both. They did both. Now tell me you can't hear the difference between these two things. Here's Jane getting a rain stick in the episode Our Miss Reynolds. They're at a party after they took care of some bad guys. They're at a party and Jane is given a rain stick and the rain stick turns it over and it sounds like it's raining. That's white noise. In the same episode at the very end, he has to shoot his gun what is it called? Vera. He has to shoot his Vera to save the ship and all the passengers on it. And so Vera gets fired. Now, they fire Vera in space and you never get to hear it, but you know what it sounds like. It sounds like this. Those two are exactly the same. The sound of the gun firing and the sound of the rain stick, they're exactly the same spectrally. Spectrally, they're exactly the same. The difference is, when the gun is fired, those are all cosine waves, all building up into one impulse. But for the white noise, the rain stick, those are all the same amplitude, but they're all random. The phase is random. So the phase of the rain stick and the phase of the rifle are different, and you can hear it. So Feynman was wrong. I'm right. Feynman, according to PBS, Feynman was second only to Einstein. So what does that say about me? I beat Feynman. 
so I'm second only, nobody else. Feynman going down, and I am second only to Einstein. Okay, it sounds ridiculous. I don't mean to make it sound that way, but um, it's a really cool thing. You're not necessarily going to discover these things when you're young. It's quite possible you'll have to get a lifetime of experience to figure it out. And put yourself out there. Try to get out there and like get some experience. Anyway, that's enough of that. So, happy Saturday. Once again, from the river, this is Dan Bullard.